Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Who would think to use this passage at this time of year? Luke, chapter 2. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. He thought rather well of himself. <laughs> this was the first census taken while uh, Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house of the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there, was, there uh, has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they came in a hurry, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told to them. I take the risk of reading 20 verses from my text this morning because there are some things in this passage that I just have never really understood. Um, things that we in our Christmas traditions just kind of pass over. We just kind of assume. And we don't often stop and ask questions when we read that story. Things that traditions say, but the Bible really doesn't say. And as this is the year that we've set aside for taking back our Bibles for committing ourselves to being more than just hearers of the word, but, but really seeing what the word says and doing what the word says, that rather than just uh, depend on tradition, let's search the word and find out what the answers are to some of these questions. Now, when I read this passage, I've always thought that the angel's announcement of Jesus' birth to the shepherds was kind of overkill. Just a little bit, <laughs> uh, compared to the other announcements. And we saw last week how we read the angel of the Lord came to Mary one-on-one -on -one and talked to her and told her what was going to happen. The angel came to Joseph one-on-one -on -one and talked to him, came to Zechariah and talked to him and prepared him. And these were major players in the birth. You don't get much closer than Jesus' mom and dad and aunt and uncle. Uh, these were pretty close. Folks, but when they come to these shepherds, and again, as we said last week, the shepherds uh, were really kind of the lowest people in society in terms of if there's a social ladder, they're kind of on the bottom. That not only do the angels announce the birth of the Savior, 
but and, and tell them that it's happening now in the city of David. But after the announcement, I mean, this this laser light show takes takes place. I mean, a multitude of angels show up and they begin to sing and. And it must have looked like the grand finale of a fireworks display. All of these angels coming from heaven and, and singing glorified. Just for a handful of shepherds standing in a field. You ever thought about that? It, it seemed to me like just a little bit of overkill for these guys. And in fact, it's the second of only two times in the Bible when the angels come and manifest themselves like this on earth. One time in the book of Genesis and the other time here at the announcement of the birth of Jesus to a handful of shepherds. Everybody go, hmm. You ever thought about that? What made them so special? Why the big fireworks display for just these shepherds? I, I mean, I would think if I was doing it, if I were God, you ever started a sentence that way? I used to do it with my daughters a lot, right, Jana? <laughs> Uh, but, but wouldn't you think, if you were going to make that kind of display, that kind of, wouldn't it be to Mary? She, I mean, if anybody was going to need a fireworks display to get her through the next nine months, it was going to be Mary, you know, uh, or Joseph. Or, but, but it's these shepherds, and, and I just, um, and then when the angels depart from, from them, it's, it's all quiet again. Nobody else saw the display. Nobody else heard the angels singing. Like we just heard. Uh, nobody heard that. Nobody was around uh, except for a handful of shepherds on the outskirts of Bethlehem. Luke uh, probably heard this story or got this part of the story from Mary. Uh, we, most scholars believe that, that uh, Luke's uh, story of the nativity comes from Mary. Because uh, he wasn't there, he wasn't at Jesus' birth. Or maybe it came from the shepherds themselves because the shepherds told everybody they saw what happened to them. And so maybe one of the shepherds talked to Luke about it, but somehow uh, he gets it and, and, um, and it's there. Uh, why were these shepherds so important uh, in the first Christmas story? And I guess... You know, one of the things that we can do is just make application for our own lives. And, and that's fine to do. We did that last week, uh, and just, just in, in the very practical sense that, that every person, whether you're up here or down here, every person is important to God. Every life counts. Amen? And, and we talked about that last week, that even though the shepherds were the lowest on the societal ladder, that... They counted in God's heart and in God's eyes, and so God speaks to them. And that's a great application, and, and it's certainly true. Or, or maybe it's just that the, the, the idea that the shepherds were awake. Nobody else, nobody else was awake when it happened. It happened in the middle of the night, and the shepherds were out doing their job. They were watching their flocks by night, and, and so they were there, and they saw when the angels manifested themselves and began to sing, and, and everything happened. They were the ones around to see it. And boy, that's a great message for you and me, that Jesus is coming back, amen? And the Bible is full of admonition. Be awake. Keep your eyes open, because when he comes, you, you don't want to be sleeping and everybody else was asleep when Jesus was born and when Jesus came the first time. And so just the message to the church of watching and being ready for his coming, that's a great application. Or another one that comes to mind is just that while there was no one but the shepherds there to see it, their story made it into the Bible. That's pretty cool. Their story made it into the Word of God. Somehow, uh, the Holy Spirit led Luke to find out this part of the story of Jesus' birth and record it for all time. And so even though it was just a handful of shepherds that saw this amazing revelation uh, and all of these multitudes of heavenly hosts coming from heaven and singing, even though it was just a little tiny audience over 2,000 years since it's happened, millions and millions of Christians 
have drawn hope from these words. Amen? And isn't that the way God is? God is so amazing. Things happen to you and me sometimes, and you look at them, and, and you might not see a lot of purpose to it. Uh, you might not, there's no one to hear, no one to see, but, but God is at work in those times, just like he is in the big times. And when the time was right, and, and, and maybe the fruit of that experience with God that you had, it shows up in your life. It, it shows up in the choices that you make later on, because you had, you had that experience with God at that time, and it was just you and God, and no one else was around to see or hear, but boy, it sure impacted you, and, and it changed your trajectory forever. God works that way. In fact, turn to the person next to you and say, you know, God's always working. Tell them that. God's always working. He's always working. And even the times when there's not a whole bunch of people around to see, he's still at work in our lives. And that's a great application to make from this. Good lessons. But I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I think there's something more going on here. I think there's something else that God wants us to see and wants us to know and, and uh, Oh, my goodness. What made me dig deeper into this passage is what the angels said specifically to these shepherds. In verse 12, and this will be a sign to you, Ron, to you. This will be a sign to you, you shepherds. You're going to get this. It's a message from God that you are going to understand. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes laying in a manger. Verse 15 says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, they said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened to us with... with which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. They knew they would find the newborn king in Bethlehem. That, that, that was kind of a given, the city of David. For hundreds of years, every Jew who studied Old Testament prophecy, Messianic prophecy at all, and not all of them did, um, but those who did understood Micah's prophecy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5, uh, verse 2, was written 600 years before this happened. And it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. And therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. And the rest of his brothers return and join the Israelites. And he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth. Wow, man. 600 years before Jesus is born, this prophecy is made by Micah. And the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. And, but there's a question in that. Where? Did you ever ask that? Or think about it? Where in Bethlehem? Where was he born? Bethlehem was small, but it was still a city. It wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, a house and a gas station. It was, it was a city. Uh, and it was full of travelers. The census was going on, and there were people from all over the place. How in the world were the shepherds, how were they to know where to go? Now, what manger? What stable? What, where? Traditions um, say that Jesus was probably born in a cave or a stall behind an inn in Bethlehem. And we get that idea from a logical conclusion from verse 7. Um, that he was laid in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And so like our children's program last week showed us, that 
uh, you can't have a room in the, in the whole hotel, but you can go out in the barnyard back, in the back and set up shop back there if you want to. And, and so that's how, where we get that from, with the camels and the donkeys and the little golf carts, if you were here last week. Remember that? But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that's where. How would the shepherds know where to go? And yet, when you read the passage, they ran right to Joseph and Mary and the baby lying in the middle. Ran right to him. Found him right away. Told him what the angels said. How, how would they know where to go? The angel doesn't tell him where to go. Just says that he's born in Bethlehem. Are those hard questions? No, you know what? The Bible can answer any question you ask. You throw the toughest questions you want. The Bible will help you. When we lived in Eastern Europe, every house, every town, and every village we were at had a bar. There was no such thing in, 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 in most of that part of the world of houses and lawns. And, you know, it was, it was a house with a fence around it because there was a, a place for the cow and a pig pen for the pigs and chickens running all over the place and a, and a little place for a, a coop for pigeons and, and, and uh, you know, gardens and, and pig pens and everything else. And hundreds of them, even in little villages, every house, had a, every house had a manger, had a place to feed sheep and cows and whatever else, goats. And so how would the shepherds just running to Bethlehem know where to go, what stable, what cave, what house, what, what manger, where would they, how would they know where to go? And again, the theologians from Hallmark, I'll wait, Hallmark uh, Christmas cards, you know, they, they tell us. The theologians that work at Hallmark uh, greeting cards tell us. That there was a shine, a star shining over the stable where Jesus was. There's a star, and so the shepherds could find the right manger by the star. That's what the guys at Hallmark tell us, but, but the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the star and the magi and, and all of that, that all comes a couple years later. Jesus is a couple years old when the wise men show up. So there was only one way that these shepherds knew where to go. And it was through the word of God and what the angels said that they would surely understand. This shall be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. That's the sign. A prophecy that was so much a part of their lives, so much a part of their work, that they would have understood it immediately. After the angels left, the shepherds ran right to Bethlehem. The shepherds knew exactly where to go. They knew exactly where the place the Son of God would be laying would be, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. They knew right where to go. It's these angels' words, a sign to you that answers our questions. And it answers the question, why this incredible display of glory and how they knew where to go. It comes from the Talmud, from the Jewish writings, because they came before the Christian writings. And there was a belief in the Talmud that the Messiah would be revealed in a place called Migdar Edar. Migdal Edar, the tower of the flock. The tower of the flock. And this isn't just some legend. This isn't just some obscure Jewish tradition. This comes from another messianic prophecy in the Word of God. It comes from their Bible. It comes from your Bible. But it's just one that we don't look at very often, but it's right here. It's in not Micah 5, but in Micah chapter 4. And it says this. 
Micah chapter 4, verse 8 says, And you, O tower of the flock, and that's the word migdal edar, you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it shall come. The former dominion shall come. Kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country, and you shall go to Babylon. It's talking about the Babylonian captivity. But there you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Hallelujah. It's a messianic prophecy. I wish I had the time this morning to go into everything that's being talked about here because there's, there's the part that applies to the Babylon captivity immediately, but then there is this other part that applies to these shepherds. You, O tower of the flock, just the way Micah 5 starts, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. This tower of the flock in Hebrew, uh, Migdal Edar, it was a place just outside of the city of Bethlehem. Uh, in ancient times, it was a very special, very holy place. Uh, it's not the first time that this is mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 35, verse 21. It's where Rachel, who is Jacob's wife, the mother of the 12 tribes of Israel, the mother of the 12 patriarchs. Uh, Rachel died giving birth to her youngest son, Benjamin. Now, Rachel's name, interesting enough, meant you. E-W-E. -E. Turn to the person next to you and say, what in the world is a you? Go ahead and ask them. Let them answer because it makes them feel smart. Go ahead and. A, 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 you is a, a you is a female sheep. A you is a fe and Rachel, the, the name Rachel means you, E-W-E. -E. And after she died, what Genesis tells us is that after Rachel died in childbirth, that in loving memory of his beloved um, uh, Jacob, um, who ha his name had been changed to Israel by then, he moved all of his flocks and he tended them there near Migdal Edar. So he brought all of his flocks and tended them there by the tower of the flock. And towers like this were common. This is not uncommon at all. Towers like this exist uh, around that part of the world. They even exist today. They, they were towers so that a shepherd could get up high and see all, all of the sheep or goats or what, cattle or whatever else. Uh, in times when enemies uh, were around, they could go up into a tower and they could look out and they could see enemies approaching. I think in my travels in Central Asia and in, and in the Caucasus, this is, this is a, a little village uh, uh, in uh, the Republic of Georgia, and you can see the towers there. Now, um, these aren't as old as the ones in the Bible, but it's the same idea. These towers where uh, the shepherds could go so they could look over their flocks and watch. And at the outskirts of Bethlehem was this tower of the flock. Migdal Idar. Over the years, even during the days of Jesus, this place, this tower of the flock, was a holy place for the Jewish people. In memory of Rachel, the you, the mother of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sheep that were pastured there around Migdal Idar. They were not ordinary sheep. They weren't used for the ordinary purposes of wool and parchment and leather and food and um, that kind of thing. The sheep that were raised around the tower of the flock were, were holy. They had a holy purpose. Passover lambs were born there. Passover lambs were born there. 
And the shepherds working around the tower of the flock near Bethlehem, they weren't ordinary shepherds just tending these ordinary sheep. These were the temple flocks. And at the base of the tower, Migdal Edar, um, for generations, uh, shepherds uh, like the ones in our Bible story here in the, the, the birth of Jesus would take a ewe who was getting ready to be born, or to, to, to uh, have, a, have a lamb, right? Baby sheep is a lamb, right? How many know that? Okay, well, the rest, rest of you catch up. It's a lamb. And when the ewe was ready to have a lamb, the shepherds would bring the ewe into the tower of the flock. It was ceremonially clean by the priests. There were cloths there in the base of the tower of the flock. The shepherds were trained so that when that baby lamb was born, uh, they would inspect the lamb because Moses in the law said that a lamb that was to be offered in sacrifice, especially Passover, was to be without blemish, no bruises, no broken bones, no blemish. It had to be a perfect lamb. And, and if, as the shepherds inspected uh, the baby lamb as it was born, if it had any blemishes, it was released out into the flock and used for wool or, or, or food or whatever. But if the lamb was perfect ceremonially, um, according to the law, if it was clean, then it was wrapped in these swaddling cloths and taken to Jerusalem to the temple to be used in the sacrifices for the sins of Israel. Now everybody go, hmm, hmm. The tower of the flock was a place that was very well known to these shepherds in the Christmas story. They worked there every day and every night. They took care of those flocks, the temple flocks. And a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger, perfect sign for you. Hallelujah. The Passover lamb. The child looked like a clean Passover lamb. I can't think of a more clear sign for these men. These shepherds, this will be a sign for you, the angel said. They were the first ones to see the Lamb of God who was born our perfect Passover sacrifice. Hallelujah. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came into this world and was wrapped in swaddling clothes just like a Passover lamb, was the redeemer, not just of the people of Israel, but the people of the world. That's why the angel said, this is good, good news, not just for you, but for the whole world. He is the Savior, Christ the Lord, and he's born right where God said he would be born. And that's how those shepherds could jump up after the light show and run immediately to the place where, where the baby would be. They didn't have to look from house to house to house, from barn to barn to barn to barn. They knew exactly where to go, to go to the place where Passover lambs were born. And there they found a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. Hallelujah. Our Redeemer is here. He's right here. He's right where God said that he would be in the book of Micah. Glory to God. No wonder the angels went into overdrive when they gave them the announcement. When, when these temple shepherds who would understand what they were saying, no wonder that the, the heavens exploded and angels began to sing glory to God in the highest. It was because the Passover lamb, not just for Israel, but for all of the world, had been born that night. And they would know, and they would know what to look for and where to go and where to find him. And they ran right to the place and they said, there is our Savior. He's come. He's come just like God said he would. Hallelujah. 30 years later, 30 years later, John the Baptist, his cousin, Jesus' cousin, would stand and he would point to Jesus and he would say, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. But you know what? 
Those shepherds had already known about it for 30 years. Hallelujah. Turn to the person next to you. Just say, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Will you stand with me for a moment? What does this mean? Well, I mean, obviously... When, when I find things like this, guys, my reverence for God's word, my reverence for God himself, just it always explodes. Amen? It just, God, you are so amazing. You don't leave anything to happenstance. You don't. You, you, right down to the place, right down to the guys who needed to know. And you showed them first. I don't know about you, but I like to worship a God like that. Don't you? A God who knows. A God who gives us what we need to get through our lives. And sometimes, you know, we walk through this world and stuff is dark and we don't understand and, 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 and things happen and, and we don't, but God does. God does. And if a God is, is so, loves us so much that he would tell a group of shepherds in the middle of the night where to find this baby and make sure that Mary would wrap him in swaddling cloths and put him in a manger just like a Passover lamb. God knows what he's doing. Amen. And sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes I don't know what's going on in the world. And I'm sure as Mary and Joseph sat in the tower of the flock because it was the place where they could find to have a baby that night. They didn't know what was going on. But God did. Can you imagine when those shepherds showed up, the temple shepherds showed up and told them what the angels said? Mary must have just went, oh, thank you, Lord. I thought I was going nuts. Because it had been nine months since, since anything had happened. God loves you. God knows your life. He knows the way the world is swirling around you. The questions that you have. The things that just aren't, that make absolutely no sense and the price you paid for that. But he loves you. And he has a plan in all of it. And he has a direction for all of it. And you belong to him. Hallelujah. And the message that the angels gave the shepherd to be a sign for them is a sign for you. I've got you. I know you. I love you. And I'm sending this child for you. So that the brokenness of your life can be healed. So that the emptiness can be filled. So that the temperate breath that is this life can have meaning and have eternal purpose. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Later on, as he sat with his disciples around the table... And he revealed on that Passover night before he died, and he revealed again that he would be the sacrifice who takes away the sins of the world. Even then, the disciples didn't understand why he was doing it, but it was revealed to the prophets hundreds of years before he was born. God knows what he's doing, and he's know what he's, he knows what he's doing in your life, and he loves you. Will you bow your heads with me for a moment? Perhaps you're here this morning and, and you're coming into this Christmas season and right now there's not a lot in your world that makes sense. And all of us get in those places. I know I've been there. 
But when they don't, that's when we turn to the God who does, who knows us best and loves us most. And maybe this morning you've You've been kind of straying away from God. You, you, you have more questions than you have answers, and you've been struggling, and, and, and you've been cold when it comes to you and God. And you'd say just by slipping up your hand, Pastor, I, I need to draw close again. I, I need to get my heart and my life right with God. I, I've been so caught up in the things of my life in this world that I'm distracted and I I need to come back. I need to be back. Thank you. Just slip up your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Yes, thank you. Hands going up all over. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Jesus, I thank you for these dear ones who've lifted their hands. Sometimes this time of year can, can just stir up a lot of stuff inside of us. But we come to you, Lord. We come to the one who established you, O oh Lord, are the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before we were created, you had already been the Passover lamb. When we get to heaven on that day, as John saw in the book of Revelation, we will see on the throne of the living God a lamb as it had been slain, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so between those two times comes everything else, and God, we just decide right now to give it to you, to give you our lives, to give you our questions, to give you our hurts and confusion, our circumstances, our families. Lord, any God who can be so clear and so specific in the prophecy of the coming of his son is a God I want to worship and follow because you're going to make a way for me where there doesn't seem to be a way. And so, Lord, we just rededicate our lives to you. We rededicate our steps to you. We give you the hurt. We give you the questions. And we say, surely... This is the Lamb of God. And I'm going to trust Him. And I'm going to follow Him. All the days of my life. I pray for every home that's represented in this room. Every family. Every heart. Every life. Lord, as this time comes around, we, we have people coming in from all over, and many of them don't know you. I pray that this would be the season when people would find the lamb. Family members would find the lamb. Prodigals would come home. Rifts and broken places would be healed and restored in our lives. I pray the blood of Jesus on every house Every marriage, every child, every relationship. I pray for glory, that this Christmas season would be a season of glory for your people. Just as it was glory for those shepherds as they watched the laser show go on above them. Let there be glory in the lives of your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. You have a wonderful, wonderful week. Praise God.